Good afternoon. And welcome to the DC Chamber of Commerce's 2011 Policy Forum and Legislative Reception. I am Gina Adams, Chair of the DC Chamber, and I am honored to welcome you to this exciting event. This is our third annual Policy Forum because so many of you provided us with such positive feedback about our prior sessions, we have decided to make this event part of our annual programming each year. Before I introduce our forum hosts, I'd like to thank our policy forum sponsor, Pfizer. Pfizer continues to be a valued partner in the district and a critical stakeholder in, the, in our ongoing effort to find real solutions for treatment and prevention of diseases and to encourage healthier living in our community. Pfizer is the largest biopharmaceutical company in the world. Most of us know it as an industry leader in developing innovative medicines for human use but they also produce medicines for animals, nutritional products, and many of the world's best known consumer products, including Advil products, Anbasol, Caltrate, Centrum, and of course, Viagra. To further secure its place in our lives as a healthcare company and a great corporate citizen, Pfizer also continues its invaluable service to our community through a number of programs that benefit the underinsured and the uninsured. For example, its cutting edge maintain program is a unique patient assistance program that helps Washingtonians who lost their jobs and prescription drug coverage on or after January 1, 2009, and who are in financial need, continue to get their Pfizer medicine free of charge for up to 12 months or until they become insured. Pfizer also gave nearly 1,000 underinsured and uninsured DC residents 2,000 500 free prescriptions worth more than $500,000 in savings on prescription medicines in 2010 alone. These extensive pro these programs combine to give Pfizer the largest and most extensive set of patient assistance programs in the United States, offering more than 70 medicines free of charge to patients in need. Now, I don't have enough time to tell you about all of the ways Pfizer serves our community, but I can tell you that they are a model for the rest of us. Through their commitment and ability to create and sustain innovative public-private partnerships that deliver positive health outcomes for DC residents. These relationships include participation in the mayor's and DC Department of Health's Live Well DC Community Coalition and the Keep It Moving campaign for senior health and well wellness with the Department of Parks and Recreation of particular note and our of particular note and our disproportionately ravaged community is Pfizer's involvement with the mayor, the DC Department of Health, and the Global Business Coalition on HIV AIDS. Its purpose is to raise awareness and urge regular testing among city res residents when they seek medical care. On the political front, Pfizer supports public policies that promote increased access to affordable quality healthcare, and responsible use of health information technology. 
as we acknowledge and thank them for their exemplary corporate citizenship and their sponsorship today, they've only asked that I convey one message to all of us. See your doctor regularly, eat healthy, stay active, and if your health care provider gives you a medicine, remember to take it. Let's thank Pfizer. I'd also like to thank our legislative reception sponsor, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of the Mid-Atlantic States. Kaiser Permanente of the Mid-Atlantic States region provides and coordinates complete health care services for almost 500,000 members through 30 medical centers in Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Virginia. Their work over the past year speaks volumes to the commitment they have made to the region and particularly Washington. I could not possibly list everything they have done, but to give you a taste of what they have achieved, in January, they opened their new medical facility, the Kaiser Permanente Capitol Hill Medical Center, the new center staffed by approximately 400 employees and physicians, which offers members state-of-the-art health care and maximum convenience, all supported by industry-leading technology and information systems. The medical center is equipped with digital signage technology that enhances the member experience while reinforcing preventive care resources. And as if a new medical center was not enough, Kaiser unveiled a new generation of the mobile health vehicle designed to mirror a small medical center on wheels. The state-of-the-art mobile health vehicle is equipped with computers and wired with Kaiser Permanente's electric health record system. The mobile health vehicle will be bring electronic care support services and connectivity directly to members at a number of venues throughout the region. In addition to the real-time update capabilities, the mobile health team can conduct video consultation with caregivers and specialists. This exemplifies how coordinating health care and leveraging the power of advanced information technologies allows Kaiser Permanente's mobile health team to achieve superior quality outcomes. Kaiser Permanente has also been honored with a regional breastfeeding friendly workplace award from the District of Columbia <coughs> Breastfeeding Coalition in recognition of the supportive work environment provided to its employees and have partnered with social services agencies and awards in Ward 7 and 8 to actively address childhood obesity in Washington. In 2010, Kaiser's charitable contributions topped $35 million. Approximately $25 million was used for direct medical care and insurance coverage for uninsured and underinsured residents of our region, and another $10 million in grants, donations, and sponsorships went to organizations that support the health of this region. Great things are happening in Washington, and Kaiser is at the forefront working in partnership to make Washington, D.C. a healthier place to live, work, and play. Let's thank Kaiser. And now I'd like to invite our host for the Policy Forum, Pfizer <clears throat> Senior Director of National Government Relations and Multicultural Affairs, Melissa Bishop Murphy, to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the D.C. Chamber of Commerce's 2011 Health Policy Forum. 
making Washington, D.C. a healthier place to do business. I would like to add my thanks to Gina and Gina's thanks to the gold, silver, and bronze event sponsors, and you'll find them listed in the event program. Their sponsorship demonstrates their commitment and support to make D.C. a healthier place to live. Now, due to the economy, the past few years have been difficult for many Washington metro area businesses. As the dust settles, a new economic era is emerging. To ensure that we are ready to meet and embrace the changes that await our economy, we all must work together. We must make smart choices that prepare us to capitalize on our strengths in the new economy. The purpose of today's discussion is to outline a framework for becoming a model healthy city. Thank you to the chamber, the mayor, local businesses, and healthcare leaders for gathering here today. We look forward to a dynamic panel discussion and hope to gain real insight into solutions to make DC one of the healthiest places to live and work. So let me introduce our panel. They include Chester Burrell, President and CEO of Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. Suzanne. Suzanne Day Moray, 2011 President of the Washington, D.C. Association of Realtors. <laughs> Carl, Carl Harrison, Regional Manager of Capital Region M&T Bank. <laughs> Curtis Etherly, Jr., Public Affairs and Communications, Mid-Atlantic, Coca-Cola Bottling Company. Antoine Ford, President, Enlighten, Inc. John Rockwood, President of the National Rehabilitation Hospital, MedStar Health. Dr. Doug Guthrie, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business. and Dr. Tamara Foreman, Howard University College of Pharmacy, co-director of Experiential Programs. <laughs> and to moderate our discussion for today, we have one of Washington's leading political minds and civic champions, our very own Mayor Vincent <coughs> C. Gray. Mayor Gray has tirelessly advocated for the residents of the district for more than 30 years. His dedication to children and their families has been the hallmark of his service in both city government and the nonprofit sector. His lifetime of public service to the district can be best summed up by a singular governing philosophy, that the District of Columbia works best as one city. After a very successful term as council chairman and many years of public, private, and nonprofit service, on January 2nd, 2011, Vincent C. Gray was sworn in as the seventh mayor of the District of Columbia. Prior to his inauguration as mayor, he served as chairman of the Council of the District of Columbia and as council member for Ward 7. No stranger to health care, Mayor Gray served as director of the D.C. Department of Human Services. During his campaign for mayor, he pledged to continue uniting the district by focusing on job creation and economic development, a collaborative approach to school reform, safer streets in our neighborhoods, and restoring fiscal responsibility to city government. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator for the afternoon, the mayor of the District of Columbia, the Honorable Vincent C. Gray. Thank you very much for such a nice introduction, and I'm delighted to be here uh, with the Chamber of Commerce and with such a distinguished panel, and um, we're going to make this interactive throughout rather than have presentations, <clears throat> and then at the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for each of you uh, to pose your questions uh, as well when we come to that point. Um, you know, I'm reminded constantly by the Chamber that we are 51 out of 51 uh, in terms of uh, the receptivity to doing business in the District of Columbia. Actually, I wish we were 51 out of 51. That means we would be, we would be a state. Uh, 
uh, all too often, I think we are compared, uh, you know, when, when there is a not necessarily favorable comparison to be drawn, we become a state for those purposes. And it wasn't the chamber that did this, it was another uh, group that did these rankings. But be that as it may, uh, however people want to characterize us, we want to be, you know, we want to get better and better and better. Uh, actually, I was uh, at an event today where we, uh, we'll talk a little bit about a green economy, but we actually are, uh, in terms of LEED certified buildings, uh, as well as LEED uh, certified square footage, we are at or near the top uh, in the nation uh, in those environmental indices. So uh, whether you want to compare us to being a state or a city in those instances, uh, we have achieved a great deal. And we need to do that on the healthcare front and certainly on the economic development front uh, as well. You know, we want to put a sign at the uh, Virginia line, at the Maryland line that says the District of Columbia is open for business. And we want people to flock here because they see uh, the opportunity for us to be able to do that. It was interesting to listen to the uh, presentation about Pfizer and about Kaiser. That rhymes, doesn't it? <laughs> Pfizer and Kaiser. Pfizer and Kaiser. Yeah, that'd be a great company. Maybe it should merge. Um, <laughs> in any event, uh, there were some health indicators that were cited. And I think that I think it's kind of a double entendre for today's discussion. You know, in the narrow sense, we want to focus on health issues. But we also want to focus on how we create a healthy economy and also create a healthy workforce uh, in the District of Columbia. Um, there was mention of uh, the uh, HIV AIDS epidemic in the District of Columbia and really can only be characterized as that. Uh, Three percent of our population uh, has the virus um, and uh, the national average is one percent. It means that we have over 15,000 people who are HIV positive uh, in the District of Columbia and um, it's going to take us a while to get out of that. We just, uh, we just launched about two weeks ago a very bold initiative, Treatment on Demand. Uh, and the purpose of that, frankly, obviously, is for those who are identified as being HIV positive to feel that they can reach out uh, to us to get treatment. But also we know that with the improvements in pharmacology uh, in today's society, it really has the effect of reducing to some extent the presence of the virus uh, in one's bloodstream and followed in a strict regimen can actually reduce the risk of transmitting uh, the virus. Uh, we also know that there are other programs. We hope to be able to continue our needle uh, exchange program in the District of Columbia and hope that there are no social riders that are placed on our budget that would somehow proscribe us from being able to do that. Um, and also obviously diminishing to the extent we can the extent to which people uh, engage in, in risky behavior. Um, in addition to that, we seem to have almost any, any in index you look at, you know, heart disease, cancer, hypertension, kidney, really are extremely high in the District of Columbia. And even more so when you go east, when you go to Ward 7 and 8, you find that the, those conditions are more prevalent in those communities than uh, virtually any other in the District of Columbia and obviously is a, you know, a cause for concern uh, to us to one, get, to, get at the bottom of why, and then what do we do about it? Because that has implications then for a healthy workforce, which is the other part of our uh, discussion uh, today. So um, our discussion will focus on how we create a more healthy population in the District of Columbia. How do we attack problems like poor nutrition uh, and insufficient physical activity on the part of many people? Um, and then obesity as a result of that. And then how do we grow our, our city? How do we expand our tax base? Uh, how do we prepare more residents for jobs as we look at the, the uh, you know, western end of the city? Our unemployment rate is around 3 or 4 percent. On the eastern end, it rises to as much as 30 percent. And that is completely and totally unacceptable, um, obviously. So uh, the real question is, how do we help this city reach its full potential? And that's what we want to hear from the panel uh, about uh, today. Um, it's going to be hard, I think, to get every panel member to answer every question. Um, and you certainly are welcome to jump in. If you hear a response that you think you'd like to respond to, um, please do so. And I want to thank this large audience for coming today, because it must have been mighty difficult to resist turning on your television and watching Ma March Madness, <laughs> uh, which started last night um, and uh, continues today. And just on a, on a note in terms of economic development, I am delighted that we are hosting games at the Verizon Center. 
Uh, we had uh, four games yesterday, and we'll have two games tomorrow. And frankly, in the interest of our city, I hope, one, it attracted a lot of people to the city, and I hope they spend every dime that they have. <laughs> <laughs> and in addition to that, we take checks, we take credit cards, <laughs> and uh, given the state of our budget at this stage, I'm willing to take an IOU from the United States. <laughs> Um, let, me, let, me start, let me start with uh, a, a broad question, and uh, I'll start with Chet, and then we'll, go, we'll just go around from, uh, from there. Um, what do you all think, you know, each of you has your own field, what do you think should be the economic priorities um, where we can attract investments in the District of Columbia? We know we are a government town. Uh, we know we've been advantaged by that with the federal government and with our own government, and we probably always will be. We know that tourism and hospitality is a critical part of what we do in this city. But at the same time, you know, we think, I know, we should expand that base so that we aren't vulnerable to changes in one of those two areas that really have, a, uh, have the effect of attacking our uh, economy and our revenue base in the city. We've seen the ill effects of that over the last, um, over the last uh, three years as we've entered a recession that has taken down our revenue by hundreds of millions of dollars. We now have an opportunity going forward, I think, to broaden that, rather than just simply look at cuts as a way of doing it. How do we then identify what those economic priorities ought to be in the District of Columbia and move forward in concert, public and private sector together, in order to be able to uh, effectuate what we decide would be uh, areas to, to move in? So we'll start with you, Chet. Okay. And by the way, before you do, is everybody aware that we have about 30,000 jobs in healthcare in the District of Columbia? Uh, it's one of the largest employer industries uh, in this city, and not a lot of people realize that. Uh, that is true, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we ourselves have about 1,200 jobs here in the district, a $100 million a year payroll. Uh, the district has a tremendous amount to offer. We're certainly proud and pleased to be here in the numbers that we're here. Um, we cover tens of thousands of people from an insurance standpoint. Um, I would say this, that the cost of doing business in the district, and the topic maybe that is the focal point of today, um, after payroll, for us as an employer, and I think for most others, the cost of health care is the second most important item of expense. And the cost today of covering a family of four in the district, and we as an employer experience this ourselves, is something bordering on $20,000 a year for a standard insurance program for a family of four. And when you ask why is it so expensive, you touched on some of the factors earlier. Um, in many of the employers that we survey, the level of obesity in the employment base is something bordering on 70% overweight or obese. And with that comes uh, diabetes, heart disease, and a series of other chronic conditions. And if there's anything that can be done to cut down the level of obesity, raising uh, awareness and fitness, better diet, and what we're very interested in doing is looking at whether in the way that you can get a safe driver credit uh, on, an, on a car policy, can you get a monetary reward for living a healthier lifestyle? I want to put one statistic that always hits me um, in perspective, which is of all the people we serve in this community, tens of thousands of people, 5% of them have multiple chronic disease and they explain 30 to 40% of all of the medical spending that goes on. Okay, let, let me bring you back, though, to where, where we want to take this, and that is we realize that we're federal sec the federal sector is a huge part of our employer base in the city. We realize uh, hospitality and tourism is a huge part of that. But where do we expand from there? Are you suggesting that we should span expand our uh, presence in health care? or are there other endeavors that this city ought to look at to be able to expand the revenue base? We're, we're largely a service economy. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I see that changing. 
but in order to attract service businesses. And what services would they be? And I'm not going to focus only financial so services, I agree legal, with that. Um, all the things that spin around professional services that, uh, in some way or another, are often connected to government, in one way or the other. Antoine Ford, why don't you weigh in on that one? Um, I, I think. If, if you look at some of the services that we have, and this is really going back to the other issue of employability, um, some of the largest contractors in the area that do business both locally and the federal government don't exist in D.C. They're located around. And so if we look at how to encourage them to getting into areas such as the cybersecurity area, we got cloud computing. We're talking about the medical health information exchange. Right now, that's one of the biggest issues if you look at what's happening between DOD and the Department of Veteran <coughs> Affairs. They're trying to say, how do we share health information? And so these are some of the issues that we face about sharing medical information that's not being tackled today by local businesses. Bo both of you have gone to health care um, as, as the answer to that question. I'm not suggesting it's not accurate, uh, hardly. But is that, is that where we should put our chips down to say this is where we want to expand? We think there are going to be more jobs in this area? Is that, is that what we should do to expand the economy beyond uh, hospitality, tourism, and the federal sector in the city? Well, I think I would, I would honestly, maybe a self-serving being a technology company, but I would look at the technology industry a little bit more um, because the technology we industry. Well. We, we use technology often as a term. What, 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 what would we say to these folks out here uh, and with more precision about how we should pursue technology as, a, as an ex expansion of our economy? Well, let, let, let's look at how we use. Um, how many people today have a BlackBerry, an iPhone, an I've iPad? Actually got, I've actually got three. You got three. <laughs> <laughs> and so if we look at businesses that are able to look at how do we make business in this city via technology? Um, how do we offer services via technology? How do we ensure that the business of this city, everything that we do, can be enabled via technology? And we need more of the service sectors. In the federal sector, they're doing it. Um, they're doing it quite quickly and honestly, but we don't have those businesses here. And we need to encourage those businesses with tax incentives, um, employability to actually locate in this city. You have the, uh, the daunting task at George Washington University, an outstanding institution, I might add. <laughs> um, you have the daunting task, Doug, of looking at uh, training people for careers in business and being able to connect them with a city that they hopefully will work in. So where do you, where do you <coughs> see our, our opportunities to expand this economy? Um, the, the first thing I would say is that, first of all, I, I really commend the framing of the question as really thinking about cross-industry strategic and industrial development. But I want to disagree a little bit with the idea that we should be moving away from manufacturing. Um, we are fundamentally a services economy. As you mentioned, of course, the government procurement is a $67 billion business in this area. It's got a lot of richness to it. But there are two areas that I would like to see the district move in the direction of, and I'm going to use two other cities as examples that have worked very well in this sector. Let me preface this by saying the reason I think we can't walk away from manufacturing is when you cite statistics of the 30 percent of job of unemployment in Ward 7 or 8, these are people that I think will do, would do well and benefit tremendously from actually having a manufacturing sector move back to the city. And there are places, there are cities that have done well in rebuilding themselves in new manufacturing areas. So the first that, we, that, that you mentioned was health care. Now, the city of Pittsburgh, after it was decimated from the loss of steel jobs in the 1970s and 1980s, they looked around the city and saw what was the largest employer in the city. It happened to be the University of Pittsburgh Health Center. But they didn't seek to build a city that was built around doctors. They sought to build a city that was built around the ancillary industries that support that. So they built in areas of healthcare, uh, healthcare technologies, of healthcare machinery, of robotics, in areas that were actually manufacturing jobs that would then support that thriving industry. Uh, those are jobs, they're skilled labor jobs, so we would need to invest in vocational education to get people there, but they're really important jobs to build an economy around. Where do we do that? Where do we make those investments in, I'll, I'll call it career and technical education, so we have 21st century technology. But you're absolutely right, it is, it is vocational education, vocational training. Where, where in the city should that happen? Uh, I mean, I believe that it should happen where people, where the joblessness is, is suffering the greatest amount of pain. People and, need and, training and who, towards who, 7 and 8. Who in a leadership capacity to make that happen? 
Well, I mean, I think the, the DC Community College probably has the ability to take a leadership role on that, but it needs to be a much more concerted effort that has high level thinking at the policy level for um, high school education, because I think vocational education has to occur at the high school. And I would just caution on the use of career training, because vocational te technical education has replaced vocational education, uh, because I think that there was a movement in the 70s and 80s to move, make that move, but a lot of what was lost was the actual skilled labor training in high schools at that time. The, the one other city, I, I like your, your uh, referring earlier to renewable energy. I think the city of Chicago has done a great job at attracting uh, Excelon and, and Sun Power to actually build photovoltaic arrays in the south side of Chicago that created a tremendous amount of jobs, not just in the building of those, of those arrays, but also in, in the service and maintenance, maintenance of them. And so I actually think that, mm -hmm. that LEED certified buildings are great, but we could be building a manufacturing sector in this space and really become a leader in the, the, the national economy. Where, where do we do that in the city with so little land mass? Uh, I mean, here again, I, I, I would assume that there, are, there is enough land base in places, that, of, in parts of the city that are that, where the joblessness is, is suffering the most. And so I would think east of the river would be a great opportunity to develop some of those areas and it would bring jobs and services to that economy. Mm -hmm. um, banks are always looking to uh, invest, right, Carl? Or, or are they? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I would love to hear from you in light of this discussion, you know, that we've just had with, uh, with Chet, with uh, Antoine, and with Doug, talking about areas of expansion. Banks have to have a vision for where they want to put their investors' money. Um, from m and perspective and your own, you know, perspective as a professional in the field, what do you see as expansion opportunities that would, that would um, attract the investment uh, of our, our uh, financial uh, industries. I would definitely look at, if you look at everything that we have around us from government and everything that spawns off from that, there's enormous opportunities that present themselves for banks in this geography. So whether that's, you know, being that at this point, like Chet, Chet said, uh, we are a service-based uh, environment, there's so many opportunities that spawn from that. So financing for government contractors. You know, there, there are a couple of uh, manufacturers uh, in the, in, you know, in the area. I can think of one off, off the top of my head that's, <laughs> you know, trying to grow in, and trying to expand in the city um, in an area where it is, you know, a higher level of unemployment. So I think you, you know, it's easier for banks, it's interesting, it's easier for banks to finance, you know, those businesses that have those hard assets like manufacturers uh, than it is typically to finance your service-oriented businesses. So typically, historically, it's been easier to finance those types of entities than it is to finance your service-oriented businesses because banks want collateral. And the equipment, the materials, the inventory is the collateral in essence that you're financing. So it's much easier to finance those types of businesses than it historically has been service types of businesses. Are, are banks looking to be leaders in terms of helping to define the future um, expansion of the economy here or elsewhere? Or are banks saying, you know, let us know what's hot and we'll, we'll uh, think about investing in that, in essence, following or leading? Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, that's an interesting question. I think if a bank is really going to be committed to a geography, the only way that they're going to be successful in that geography is if that community is successful. So those banks should be playing a role in trying to help define where those opportunities are. I mean, because there's no secret. Banks are in it to make a profit. Clearly. And, you know, finance, uh, extend financing that the, they can ultimately get repaid on. So I think if, if you look at it from that perspective, uh, you, you should be engaged. I, you know, I was talking with Barbara. I want to find a way, because uh, when I look at this economy and service-oriented businesses, is, and specifically in the District of Columbia, um, we do have to have other avenues to couple with bank financing to make a lot of this like, work. Like what? Well, if, if I think about other geographies where I've been in, uh, from a banking standpoint, we need to have 
uh, I think about a program in upstate New York where they have what they call a 65-35 program. And if you look at the District of Columbia, for example, and, and some of the residents, the biggest challenge that they'll have uh, in securing bank financing is they need the equity injection. So the District of Columbia needs to have something that's available to basically fill that gap from an equity injection. And, and if you look at this recent economy and how it's impacted, you know, residents across the country and in the District of Columbia, a lot of people were really m able to make a lot of advancements and moving their businesses forward and accessing capital because they leveraged the equity that was in their homes. Well, that's not going to be to the same degree that it was in 05, 06, 07. Some people leveraged equity that wasn't there also, right? Well, yeah, and you got a lot of banks that are not around because of it. You know, but if you really think about it, now that's an area that I see that the District of Columbia can definitely play a role, in particular with its residents, to help them find and, and secure and excess capital. So if the banks can come in uh, and finance their portion, and then if there's a role where the borrowers, I still believe that the borrowers should come with some equity. They should have some stake, they should have some skin in the game. And then if the district has a program, a vehicle, an avenue that helps fill that gap, then you can see more opportunities start to happen. What is, what is M&T's perspective on what look like excellent opportunities for investment to grow the economy in the city? Well, we, we clearly see, if you look at professional services um, and, 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 and how I define that and how we define that is whether it's doctors, whether it's lawyers, whether it's architects, whether it's healthcare professionals, we see huge explosive growth in that area. Obviously, our name is manufacturers and traders. We love manufacturing. We wish there were more uh, because it's, it's, it's a great area. But with that being said, really looking at the professional services, you know, in, in all different kinds of services, but then we just figure out how can we finance them in the ways that we're not comfortable. How do you get comfortable? And typically, we find a way through the SBA to do it. Uh, Suzanne, the realtors obviously play a huge role in this city, always have. And in part, you are creating an environment within which you attract businesses, uh, as, you know, on the commercial front, obviously. Uh, what is it that you see uh, representing realtors? What is it that you see as the areas for growth uh, in, in the District of Columbia? And what are, what are, collectively, what are the realtors prepared to do to facilitate that? Um, I'd love to talk about that. Um, and to, just to let you know, my background is in residential real estate, so I do work with, uh, with homeowners and neighborhoods. I also work with developers on the residential side. And um, I would also like to say that it's, uh, it's much easier, I'm sure, to be a post-recession president of the Realtor Association than it was a couple of years ago. We're, we're in a very good, good position right now. Uh, D.C. is a very hot real estate market. There have been several um, national press articles recently about um, about DC being a market to watch. Um, and, you know, when we have a healthy market, that attracts people to this area. Um, and we've certainly seen in the growth uh, of the census that, um, that DC is uh, an attractive area for people to live. Um, people are tired of commuting long distances. Um, and um, as the city improves in terms of uh, services and uh, amenities, uh, people want to live in the District of Columbia. The benefits of Home ownership in the District of Columbia, um, you know, aside from from the social benefits of people investing in their communities, um, real estate is a huge revenue source for the District of Columbia, as I'm sure you're you're well aware when Absolutely. you were figuring out your budget. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, we want to keep the keep the revenue dollars in in DC and promote home ownership uh, in the District of Columbia. Um, what is it that the realtors can do to help us attract more? you know, more, more businesses uh, to the city. And obviously, as people who are involved in office buildings, you would want that, you, you would share that goal, I'm sure. Absolutely, well, even, even in the, on the residential side, um, you know, when I sell a home to somebody, what, what's the first thing you do when you, when you buy a home? Uh, you run over to uh, your big box store, um, get your, uh, your new sheets, your new, uh, you know, go to Home Depot, get some paint, um, hire a painter, um, you know, we talked about, you talked about green building. My neighbor's putting solar panels on his, uh, on his roof. I mean, there's uh, just, just by creating housing and encouraging housing and the home ownership in the District of Columbia, we're creating jobs. 
Curtis, you represent one of the biggest companies in America, in Coca-Cola. Um, and I buy a lot. I love Coca-Cola. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I love Pepsi, too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, is it that, what is it that Pepsi um, can contribute? Pepsi. Well, that's an easy question to answer. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> just, just playing, guys. What, what, what is it that Coca-Cola can contribute uh, to, <coughs> to the uh, growth of this economy? And what is, what is Coca-Cola's perspective on growth opportunities in the city uh, for business? Well, I, I'd like to return to something that Dr. Guthrie hit upon, and, and that is this issue of, of, of green friendly policy, sustainability, if you will. As, as you look at not only us as a manufacturer and a distributor of a consumer goods, but when you look at other manufacturing concerns, the, the type of investment that's being made on an increasingly large basis around uh, sustainable products, uh, whether it's HFC-free coolers, whether it's hybrid vehicles, of which we have approximately 30 to 40 here servicing customers in the District of Columbia, those are all critical areas where I think it is highly conceivable that the district can massage a strategic advantage, if you will. Again, as Dr. Guthrie alluded to, there's a lot of soil to be tilled in encouraging more sustainable investment, more sustainable technology and the application thereof here in the District of Columbia. When you look at the open spaces and the parks that our small jurisdiction, our small geography uh, enjoys, whether it's the untapped resource that is the Anacostia River, these are all critical assets that have been neglected for a wide array of reasons, but if they're leveraged in the right way, whether it's through increased waterfront development, and we've heard about amazing things that continue to happen as we look at the southeast-southwest waterfront. Uh, those, I think, are leverage points that could be tremendous areas of strength for the District of Columbia, and that's what we see when we look at this marketplace. It continues to be vibrant. It continues to be competitive. There's no doubt about that. But when you look at sustainability, I would also say, uh, again, putting, uh, putting Dr. Guthrie back in the spotlight, when we talk about education and research here in the District of Columbia, we have a very vigorous university community. Everyone knows that. Everyone understands that. But it can continue to grow and thrive and attract more businesses and more, uh, more entrepreneurial activity with the research and academic activity uh, uh, if, as the city continues to be more supportive. You know, you mentioned something uh, in, your, in your answer that I want to go back to, and that is the Anacostia River. Yes. Um, it, it's interesting to me. Uh, we, we've made some efforts to try to clean it up. I see Tommy Wells sitting up there who really has been uh, very involved. I've been delighted to be involved in you know, helping to generate some resources through this bag tax to uh, help clean up the river. But it's interesting, the, the uh, perception, and I talk about this a lot, the perception is when you go to London, for example, the, the Thames River is a unifying entity, a unifying resource. Go to Paris, the Seine River is the same. Here, the Anacostia River is considered to be a divider. You know, it's east of the river or west of the river. It, it doesn't unify. It is, it is a way of describing a different way of life, depending upon which side of the river that you are ta you're talking about. From an economic perspective, how do, how do we begin to, to address that? And I'll, you, you can start, and I'll, I'd love to hear from some of the rest of you, because some of the most challenging and daunting economic challenges in this city um, are reposed in wards seven and eight. And I say that, frankly, as a resident of ward seven. Yes, sir. With respect to the Anacostia River, I mean, it has most certainly been used as a metaphor for a lot of different things, and you hit that right on the head. But I think the critical starting point, and many organizations, some of which are represented here in the room, have made it their life's work, their mission, to talk precisely about this issue. And, and, and the issue that I'm alluding to is you have to make the case that the Anacostia River is not just a Ward 8 river. It's not just a Ward 7 river. Quite frankly, it's not just a, Wash a District of Columbia river. There are tributaries that flow from Prince George's County, from Montgomery County. We have to begin thinking about the river and other green resources as precisely that, regional, collective, public resources that we all must band around. Most certainly, organizations like D.C. Appleseed, which will be releasing a report soon on the Anacostia River, will help to continue that clarion call, the work that you alluded to of Councilmember Wells and other members of the council. It's critical that we all understand if the river fails, this city ultimately will continue well, Curtis, to struggle. It, it is failing. 
It is failing, and it's been failing for a very long time. The, the question for me, though, is, is how do we, in a reasonably, you know, in a reasonable period of time, begin to use it as a resource rather than being viewed as a moat, Understood. as it is now? Understood. And it's not just for you to answer. Let me, let me, uh, let me ask some of the other folks also. Uh, John, you, I know your background is in, uh, in health care, and frankly, there are a lot of health care issues that are associated with the Anacostia River and what is east of the Anacostia River. I wonder if you have any perspectives on that. Well, I, I think uh, Chet certainly touched on it. There is uh, uh, clearly uh, east of the Anacostia, I'd add in addition to HIV, uh, diabetes is, uh, is running at ec epidemic levels in the district. Uh, I think part of that has to do with um, uh, access to care, particularly uh, preventative medicine. Um, <coughs> I think it speaks to the importance of keeping United Medical Center a viable uh, health care organization serving that part of the population, but I think there's much more work to do. Uh, I think um, certainly the two largest employers uh, in the District of Columbia, I believe, are the university health care systems and then hospitals, uh, aside from the federal government. So. Uh, I, I do believe that there are um, tangible ways to make investments both in, in health care. You had mentioned in an earlier meeting uh, about some new clinics that were opening in D.C., providing that those opportunities for um, uh, those residents to access health care services, not just when they need the emergency room, but when they need uh, primary and preventative care and preventative medicine. Uh, on the education side, I believe that uh, we're still dealing with a, we've, there's been a, certainly a temporary reprieve, but the, um, uh, the issue with nursing shortages, uh, with uh, shortages in pharmacy, in uh, physical and occupational therapy, these are key uh, clinical, uh, clinical areas that we really need to see uh, a new set of enrollment, um, and that can start as, as, as early as we wish. So uh, I think those are uh, some, some tangible ways to invest east of the Anacostia River in a way that's both going to reduce costs by providing uh, better care to those residents and also provide them a little bit of, uh, of, of a better future. Healthcare is a great future. Um, it is certainly growing. The, uh, the population that's going to require those services are, are going to be there. And um, uh, I think that's an important strategy. What, what, is, it, what is it that, uh, and I throw this out to anyone, any of you that want to answer, what is it that has essentially stymied investment in 25 percent of the geography of the city, which is, um, you know, what, what Ward 7 and 8 represent. 140,000 people um, live in those two wards. Uh, there's, there's disposable income. What happens, unfortunately, is that people who live in those two wards often go to Prince George's County. They often go to Montgomery County, and they go out to Pentagon City uh, to spend their money. So it's a lost opportunity in the city. You know, I often say to people in, in Ward 7, we just doubled, you know, the number of sit-down restaurants that we have from one to two. Um, you know, in this, this area of the city, you know, that you go from block to block. There's four or five restaurants on a block. And I cite that only as an example of the, dis the disparity that we have and the amenities that are available to people. What is it this time is investment? We got, you know, we got large companies sitting up here. We got realtors. We got you know, people who run business schools uh, in the city. We've got healthcare care uh, leaders. We've got banks. Collectively, you all ought to be able to have an answer to that. So what, what, what is the answer? I, I would love to, to talk to that. Um, you know, I think, as you mentioned, there are significant perception problems mm -hmm. um, that uh, people who have may, may have never crossed the river um, have an idea of what it's like over there. Um, and, um, you know, I deal very much on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Um, and, um, you know, when I um, had the opportunity to appoint uh, presidential appointees to our, to our board of directors, I made it a point to have realtors who are working east of the river on that, uh, on that board as well as on our public policy committee so we could hear their side of, uh, of things. Um, and, um, you know, when people complain about a lack of affordable housing in the District of Columbia, you know, I'm sorry, they may not be able to buy a seven-figure house in Ward 3, but there is lots of housing in the District of Columbia that is affordable. And, um, you know, we as realtors on the, on the very ground level, very neighborhood level, promote those neighborhoods. Um, we have an, is Darren here? Darren Davis here? Um, we have a realtor that's working in, uh, in Ward 7 and 8 that um, <coughs> he's gotten Ward, Ward 7 and 8 on HGTV. 
Um, I think he's, uh, he's one of my few Facebook friends that has maxed out his uh, 5,000 uh, Facebook friends because he creates this energy around that area that people want to, that, that are attracted to. Um, and, um, you know, he promotes what is good about the, the areas that, uh, that he lives in. And that makes people want to live there. How do we change the perception? And I think there's some. I think that's there's some truth in what you said. There are, there are perceptions of what it means about that particular area of the city. Um, you know, some of it has maybe some historical uh, accuracy. Much of it is wrong uh, at this stage. How do we change that perception? Which it seems to me would be good for the city, good for the government, good for business, good for the residents. I can, I can make a case for it being good for virtually everybody who cares about the District of Columbia. So how do we change that perception, Chad? I think I just really want to echo Susan's sentiments in terms of looking at the city in reference to neighborhoods, because when you're in the business of addressing health disparities like I am, you quickly see that there's really no such thing as east of the river, because health disparities are rampant and also in Ward 1 and Ward 5. And so that's when we don't mention those part of the city, we just think that it's east of the river in Ward 7 and 8, but that's really not the case. So we need to really look at everything in reference to neighborhoods. And so when everything falls into place, when banks invest in projects, when the vocational schools are training everyone, when we have manufacturers producing gadgets and products, at the end of the day, it really comes down to your workforce and whether or not the workforce is healthy or not. And in terms of what can we do, we have to build on what the District of Columbia has already been doing in terms of increasing, not access, but really increasing the understanding and health education of everyone in the District of Columbia so that when they come to work, they are productive, they're ready to work, they're healthy, they don't have a headache, and they're ready to really produce. When we have quality products, whether that's in a service or with products, then we will make sure that the business that is started up is able to be sustained in the District of Columbia. So I think that we should maybe look at it in a different way in terms of really focusing on the workforce and not just east of the river, but in various neighborhoods. But, but there, there are folks who would say that the problems are, are um, you know, disproportionately experienced east of the river, that unemployment is disproportionately high, that um, health indices on the, on the side of pathology disproportionately high, um, that the, the presence of uh, amenities in the communities, dis absence, I, was, I should say, disproportionately high. So I think, you know, there are people who would make the argument that you should focus on East of the River because it really has been cheated in the, in the city. And the city, by not doing that, <coughs> whoever the city may be in this instance, um, has really uh, engaged in lost opportunities. It's, really, it's a catch-22 because I live in Ward 7, and so when you look at Ward 7 and East of the River, you also, also have in Ward 7 some of the most mm -hmm. highly paid persons that live in the District of Columbia, some of the people that are more in your high income bracket, some of your more healthy individuals that have access to the best, best health care also. So again, it's in terms of looking at the, per, the perception, the perception is based on the division of the river. If we look at things in neighborhoods, like Susan just mentioned, then we will decrease the perception for outside people that have never been to the District of Columbia, Ward 7 and 8 will now be more attractive because it, there's not this perception that Ward 7 and 8 is just this blighted area of the District of Columbia. Okay, and I, I agree with you. I completely, all, you guys, how, how do we change that perception? How do you get people to think differently uh, about an area of the city that's 25% of our geography? 140,000 people. Doug? So uh, I, I want to just, um, give one more example of a city that, that did do this successfully in terms of changing perception. Uh, the city of Cleveland in the 1980s suffered similarly to a lot of other cities in, in the northern uh, manufacturing industrial belt. And in 1982, uh, McKinsey came in with a report that really pushed forward Cleveland Tomorrow, that was the business organization's community, uh, the business community's organization that really drove forward uh, a kind of local economic nationalism of investment in, in 
Cleveland, but it wouldn't have worked with Cleveland Tomorrow alone. That same year, the Ford Foundation funded an organization called the Local Initiative Support Corporation that then funded 50 community development corporations around the city that then became this very lively intersection of public-private partnerships in which you had the banks uh, from, uh, with the local, uh, local uh, uh, development tax credit. Uh, you had corporations investing, and you had community development corporations actually taking ownership of that process. And when the entire community actually got in, excited about and, and, and really enlivened around the redevelopment of, of resources in that area, uh, I think you had a very, very uh, exciting time for the what economic was, what development. Was, what was the key dynamic that you well, changed I, the course? I, I think the key dynamic was leadership from together, from the corporate sector, and from the, the local nonprofit sector, and with some funding from the philanthropic world. And when you brought those three resources together, right. and then had leadership from the government really pushing this forward, I think it just, it just changed the entire dynamic. And I think we have the opportunity to do that. You know what's interesting in, the, in, in your answer? I didn't hear government anywhere. And maybe, <laughs> maybe there's some truth to that. Uh, the, the question that we continue to grapple with, what is the role of government in all of this? And you said the corporate sector, you said the philanthropic sector, and you said the nonprofit sector, none of which really is directly a part of government. So um, what is the role of government in, in, in making this happen? Well, there's definitely a role of government in there because well, if you think it? about what happened what with it? Cleveland, there was a lot of CDFIs, the Community Development Financial Institutions, that were created, and they focused on specific areas. Uh, within Cleveland. I actually used to work for KeyBank, who's headquartered in Cleveland, uh, so, and for their Community Development Corp, so somewhat familiar with what was happening in that, in that Cleveland realm. And it's, there's a lot of places that's, that's tried to mimic it, but if you look at Ward 7 and Ward 8, which in Ward 8 we actually have a branch, and we'd love for it to be more successful, we, we really look at it and say, uh, how do you look at the businesses that are there? And how do we ensure that the businesses that already exist there, I think that's the starting point, is really working with what the assets that exist there and leveraging them, um, making sure that we put something in place to help them. You know, there's a lot of them that are struggling. There's a lot of them, you know, that lack resources. And it's not just, it's not just capital, uh, but, but other resources that really can be pooled to really help those businesses become more successful. I think the first thing we have to do is help stabilize the ones that exist, and that's going to have a huge impact. When I think about areas and having toured uh, D.C. when I first got here a year and a half ago, uh, you, that wasn't on the tour schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> so I think one it's simple thing that, that perception that, that exists. I think that, that, dim that speaks to the perception. You know, as a person that was coming in, you know, from the Baltimore area, and then originally from upstate New York, you know, the Ward 7, Ward 8, and it was like, okay, so you really don't go in those areas. You know, and then obviously we have a branch in Ward 8, so I eventually went into Ward 8, and it's like, well, wait a minute, it's not. How long did you stay? No, we got a branch <laughs> there. I, so. I'm just kidding. You know, so it's not, it, it, it's not what, if, if you haven't been and, you, and you're coming from outside of the area, and, and I'm a person who's grown up in urban areas, so it, it doesn't impact me the same way, but somebody who hasn't grown up in an environment like that, and the first impression you get is like, this is not on the tourist schedule. These wards you don't really want to go into. Unfortunately, that instills the perception. You know, but when I look at it, you know, but getting back to how do we help change it, I think we, you know, we, the government has a role, and a lot of times it's the Small Business Administration that plays a role in help creating these C CDFIs. And I think the, the SBA has to play a role in creating uh, the CDFIs and helping to fund them. Chet? I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, it's interesting. We serve. 40,000 employer groups, 80% of them are employers of less than 10. Right. And so much of the vibrancy of, an econo of any economy is what's happening in the small employers. Many of them are tech, professional, yep. um, services oriented. And I myself once started a business as a uh, employee of the uh, first employee. No government ever helped. But I, was just, I just came back from a Midwestern city where they were talking about government even as the convener brought parties together, created a framework, 
helped guide through all of the myriad of government requirements and permits and other things that oftentimes stymie the development of local business. And they set the framework. They brought the parties together, they introduced the parties, and then when they discovered obstacles, they helped remove those obstacles. And that truly stimulated growth. And the other thing that's striking is that, particularly in Ward 7 or Ward 8, anywhere in the city, of reaching in um, to the high schools, even with internship programs. I just came back from a discussion last night with a foundation that said they had been doing this in places very much like Ward 7 and Ward 8, and encouraging high school students to finish high school, and in fact paying for some of their, this was business doing this, paying for some of their education beyond that, teaching them the high-tech areas, which kids are naturally drawn to anyway, web-based, this and that, software, reaching in and stimulating that. If you put those ideas together, if the district said, we will be the convener, we will see this as a central objective, we'll bring the nonprofits and the for-profits and the community organizations and look at what little businesses are in the area and help them prosper. That, that could a, help a lot. That's a nice segue to the question I want to pose to each of you, and that is, I want you to identify one strength, and I guess there's a disadvantage if you last in this string of people, right? I want you to identify one strength and one obstacle um, that you think is the strength that we need to build upon to expand economic development citywide, and what is one obstacle that you see that needs to be swept away uh, in order to be able to facilitate that? Dr. Foreman, we'll, we'll start with you. Well, I wanted to go back to, in terms of what you asked the question, in terms of what is the role of government. And I do think, I know that the District of Columbia does an excellent job in terms of utilizing and supporting community-based organizations to foster grassroots efforts to help engage the community to, again, make a healthy workforce. So that's in, healthy in terms of the type of training that they receive, healthy in terms of having increasing their access to health education, and making sure that there is a liaison between the grassroots community and community-based organizations that can work together to increase the workforce. So the government is already doing an excellent job with that. I think one of the strengths that we do have is the support of the District of Columbia to, to see the value of grassroots um, efforts and community-based organizations and continue to invest in um, health programs like the Live Well DC programs. And I think the only obstacle that we have is that we don't, we're not, um, we're not glorifying that. We're not one, talking about- One obstacle that needs to be swept away. One obstacle that needs to be swept away is to decrease the perception that the District of Columbia is not healthy. We have the lowest uninsured rate or doesn't have access to health care because we have the lowest uninsured rate in, in the nation. So I think in terms of we just decrease that perception that we don't have healthy people that are ready and willing to work, then it will help to, it will help to make sure that investors know that there's a workforce ready and viable and ready to work here. Antoine, one strength, one obstacle. Um, I think one of the strengths that I've seen being a lifelong Washingtonian is that, and this is, this is the administration that I've seen, particularly yours, is being open to ideas. I think 10 years ago it was, we know better than you, so don't worry about it. We'll tell you what you're going to do. Um, these types of forums uh, where I've actually seen conversation that this administration has had and implemented, I think is critically important because you need people, people need to know that you hear them. So I think that's a strength that we need to continue. Uh, the one weakness, quite honestly, is the streamlining. It, it, take, it is too hard to do business here. We got to streamline the process of doing business. What? Be, be more specific. I'll give you an example. What, the license. Being sense. able to what? get a license to do business here. Being able to. Um, so that would be like DCRA? DCRA. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Nick is here. Uh, we go through the DCRA process, we go through the, the qualification process, particularly for CBEs, and that's gotten actually better. The more we can put online, the better off. And I think that's actually, particularly, we mentioned earlier about the small businesses. Well, when they want to do business and they look at the process, right. they'll say, I don't want to do that. It's too hard. Mm -hmm. It's too hard. 
And if we actually able to address that, you'll actually be able to address particularly some. Are we of running that. people out of the city or or foreclosing them from coming into the city because that that that, that kind of opportunity? Oh, so yeah, certainly. I've talked to small businesses. And I'm saying, why do you want to do this? I, I don't want to go. Through. Why do they want so much information? Mm -hmm. There's fear. It's fear. Suzanne. I think um, I totally agree. I'm all for the grassroots efforts. Um, you know, we have very strong community associations. I wanted to put in a plug in for Main Street's organizations, which I think are a tremendous tool for, uh, you know, they've, they've gotten 8th Street off the ground. Um, they're helping, I, I live in the North Capitol Corridor. They're doing tremendous things there. Um, and I think it's really important to energize our residents and have them be excited about living in the District of Columbia, which brings in, you know, you know more excitement. But I also, um, you know, I've definitely run into those, those issues with, um, with the developers that I work with. Um, I got a call on a vacant property issue this morning, um, you know, where somebody had applied for condo docs and could not go forward because, uh, because of, of some of the legislative issues that we've worked on over the past year. Um, but, uh, but I think this issue of perceptions um, of, specific neighborhoods is, is really important. Um, I, I do think that that's currently a weakness, but I think we could turn it around and make it, uh, you know, do some, uh, do some branding and marketing and, and make, it, make it a strength. Mm -hmm. Doug, from, a, from the perspective of a, uh, you know, of a business school in the city, one strength, one weakness. So our greatest strength, I think, is that um, the Washington DC is a national symbol. This is, it cannot be the case that the D.C. economy is as distressed as it is, and I think you can leverage that to actually get a little leeway with the federal government to make, be very attractive to investors and particularly foreign investors. If you take, for example, the case of Huawei, uh, which was recently the deal that they were trying to buy, Three Leaf, was recently shut down by the federal government. Um, these guys need a presence in Washington, D.C., if only because they need to change the perception of themselves as a global corporation. There's a current account balance sitting over there on $2 trillion of U.S. Treasuries that need to make their way back into the U.S. economy. And you have an opportunity, I think, to just because we are D.C. and because companies need to have a presence here from around the world, and because it has to be such a national symbol, uh, I think that there is an opportunity to make very bold arguments that, that people and mayors of other cities can't can't necessarily make. The obstacle, I would, uh, to, to get a little abstract here, and I apologize, but I, I think that there is just the collective action problem of capitalism. I think that we don't push our business leaders enough to think about what it means to, all things being equal, they should be here. They should be helping businesses here. And I think you, you said a few minutes ago that you asked what the government's role is. And I love the idea of the government as convener. The government is the bully pulpit. The government is the, is, the, is the case that is the organization that can make the case that this is what we have to do because it's right. And so I, I think that that obstacle, without that kind of argument, the obstacle is just the fact that, that capital will flow where it's cheapest to flow. And that's mm -hmm. not where we want it to go. John, I'm going to give you the last word on this. Well, I, I guess I'll start with um, maybe the weakness first, if that's okay. Um, I, the one uh, consistent theme uh, that I hear uh, when uh, I talk to some uh, employees or team members that don't live in the district, one of the reasons they say they don't live in the district is because uh, they want to live um, uh, in an area that has a public school system uh, that uh, they feel comfortable with. And I know that we've been on that journey, uh, and I think that is an, a really critical journey to continue um, when patients or when, they're, when families um, have a school system they believe in. Um, uh, I think that that does promote uh, not only families but businesses uh, to, to, to either uh, uh, relocate or come back uh, to places like the district. I mean, just speaking as a, um, as a father for a moment, um, you know, even I live in the district, my kids go to public school, even thinking about private school um, is, uh, I can imagine, would be very difficult for um, a, a large number of, uh, of, of, uh, of the people that work uh, in healthcare. And so I think that's, that's an important driver. I also think, um, you know, you'd, I appreciate, Mayor Gray, you mentioning um, uh, the fact that the hospitals uh, employ 30,000 uh, 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 people in the 17 hospitals that are part of DCHA. I do think uh, that healthcare is a significant, um, 
is a significant driver in a couple of ways. Uh, we touched a little bit on research. Uh, we have NIH in our backyard. Uh, we have Georgetown University, we have G uh, George Washington University, we have some uh, world-class centers of excellence um, that uh, the more investment we make there, I think the better the, uh, the reputation of the district becomes and the more uh, professionals that we get to this area. So uh, I'd continue to focus uh, on that as, as, as a true area of growth. Thank you. I, I actually think we're at the end of our time, and I really regret that because I think we could go on for another couple of hours and it would be quite productive. Um, I want to thank all eight of you for uh, being a part of what I think was a really robust and stimulating discussion, and uh, not only individually, but collectively. And uh, I guess I'd recommend to the chamber that you continue to do this and maybe on an even more frequent basis and maybe expand the time that we have available for this kind of discussion. Very helpful to me. Um, I would love to be a part of this and continuing. <laughs> and we'll bring, uh, we'll bring Victor Hoskins uh, next time. We'll bring Nick again. Uh, we'll bring uh, Antonio Hunter. All of the folks who really, I think, uh, can be helpful with this. And I think the idea of being a convener makes perfect sense because, you know, you talk about job creation, but governments typically don't create jobs. Job, the, the, I think the government has to provide an environment within which people feel good about coming to do business and then make sure we build on the strengths and sweep away obstacles like permitting and licensing and other disincentives that encourage people uh, to go elsewhere. So um, I ask you to give the uh, panel a big hand for their participation. Today. And now I want to turn it back over to the uh, chairman of the board, Gina Adams. Uh, let's give our mayor a big round of applause. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. That was a great exchange. Thank you all for being here. I think we have time for just a couple of questions. You should have received a little white card uh, at the registration. If you have a question, if you'd write it down, hopefully you've written some already, and you can pass them along to the staff that'll be on the aisle. If you need a card, uh, then please raise your hand, and we're gonna try to do this quickly. I think we're a little bit behind on time. So let me begin with the first question, and I'll pose it uh, uh, to our, our mayor. Um, and we've been talking about this a little bit. The hospitals make up a large and uh, crucial portion of our healthcare system, yet, like many of the city's other providers, all of us uh, have suffered from a number of funding cuts and assessments in recent years. Um, how do you think these financial setbacks have impacted the district's ability to provide care to its residents and ensure the health of our communities? Well, there's no question that we have been in a uh, recessionary environment now for well into three years, and it has impacted every sector uh, of the District of Columbia. Um, I suppose the good news is that in this budget, um, the, the upside is that we actually have gotten some additional revenue that we will invest. We've got $105 million new dollars that we will invest, and frankly, the lion's share of that will go into uh, education, because I agree with John. Uh, everybody, all boats will rise if we make those investments. More people will want to live here. More companies will want to be here because it's an indigenous workforce, and it will inherently improve uh, the quality of life. At the same time, I recognize that we've asked, we've asked the healthcare industry, we've asked, asked virtually every industry uh, to contribute to keeping the city uh, vital and viable. And there will be more of that in the next budget. The upside is, is that um, I, I believe that we are on the backside of this recession. And I think when we get to fiscal year 13, we're going to see, uh, see our ability to improve our investments. And health care is obviously one, for me anyway, that I want to invest more in. Uh, we've invested, and it was a key point that was made. We've invested a lot in health care coverage, but we haven't invested enough in health care access. And you've got people who are sitting with insurance in some parts of the city who don't have any health care system in their midst at all. Okay, thank you. I've gotten a few uh, questions like this, so I'll, I'll ask it. Um, with the lowest rate of individuals without health care insurance, 
why does the District of Columbia have the highest rates of death due to chronic disease <coughs> such as HIV AIDS, cancer, hypertension, et cetera? Well, I'll start and, you know, others can jump in. Um, first of all, not, and not to be defensive, but I wonder what, when you say the highest rate, who are we, who are we being compared to? Uh, because a lot of other cities have high rates uh, as well. But that notwithstanding, I think it goes back to the issue that I mentioned earlier, and that is we have very uneven access to health care services in the city. Um, I think it was John that mentioned it's important, and I agree with him, that we keep the United Medical Center operational, be it in the private sector or public sector. But after you get past that hospital, the best you have is a patchwork set of health care services on the eastern end of the city. We are now building a new clinic to replace the W Street Clinic. That will be on Galen Street and will double the number of patient visits uh, annually that can be made. We are committed to a health care facility, a primary care facility in uh, Parkside, um, which, uh, of course, is in Ward 7. Uh, another one on South Capitol Street. Um, until we build a, a health care system, which I want to work on, which I am committed to emphasizing, we will continue to talk about that strange phenomenon, and that is we got all these people with health care insurance and we got all these health care problems. Again, we have to recognize that having health care insurance is just, is just simply a, a passport to a service. For, for many of our people, they don't have a service to access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you want to say something? Just um, uh, a couple quick points. I, I certainly agree with uh, uh, the mayor on uh, all of his points. I think um, I think it's important that um, uh, the healthcare system in the District of Columbia, obviously, uh, hospitals across the country are uh, dealing. They're in a precarious position. Um, there are stagnant Medicare rates. Uh, there are growing numbers of enrollees in the Medicaid platform uh, across the country, and I think that is uh, putting some real uh, pressures uh, on, uh, on cost and on uh, new and innovate, innovative ways of thinking. So I think it's, it's a real challenge, but it's also uh, a real opportunity. Uh, one of the strategies that we have uh, at MedStar Health is really focusing on programs and services that don't need to be on our hospital campuses that make it more convenient for uh, patients to access our services, but also provide the level of services that they need um, without getting to the hospital environment. So um, I think there's some opportunities uh, uh, while we uh, understand and better analyze uh, and listen to the healthcare reform debate and what comes out of that, uh, I certainly believe there are some real opportunities to do, um, to receive uh, pilot funding or uh, demonstration project funding to look at some of these diagnostic groups because I, I do think chronic heart failure, diabetes, these are a large percentage of healthcare costs to Chet's earlier point. Um, if we can, uh, as a healthcare system, and that would include payers and hospitals alike, if we can um, uh, provide better access to those services in a preventative way. Um, the medical home model is uh, one area that has worked in other environments that we've been piloting in various settings. Uh, I know at the hospital center, uh, I believe there are, are a number of ways for us to be, work, us to be able to work together, um, both from the district government and from the private healthcare sector. Maybe just to build and strengthen on that very point, I don't think you need to think so much about building more hospital-centric oh, no. services, and I didn't think you said that, but, mm -hmm. but you touched on something that I think makes total sense, which is more primary care, more primary care medical home, office-based practice. The technology better enables it. Um, we are putting a tremendous emphasis on that, providing more reimbursement for that. And there are ways, I think, for the public and private sector to work together to foster it. Putting more of that in, in Ward 7 and 8 would help tremendously. Maybe one other thing, there's so many problems entwined with so many others. But a lot of times, and I think you touched on this early, if you look at those wards and other parts of the city, it's very hard to get access to healthy food. I mean, what you have is fast food. Yes. You have McDonald's. You have things of that nature. We have a little booklet that we put out that lists the menus of all the fast food restaurants and that are listed green, yellow, red, orange as to what is good for you and what, what is not. You have menus filled with red. It says if you eat this, you're eating high fat, high calories, high salt, and that is what is oftentimes the most readily available 
food substance. Uh, and these things are not easy to fix, but it leads to obesity, heart disease, and so on. It's not just having more care providers. It's what else are the other alternatives available, and how do you foster that? You know, and bringing, and bringing diversified health care services to other parts of the city also brings economic development and business. Yes. It brings jobs and it brings exactly. um, other businesses to those areas of the city. I just really want to mention that, but we are underutilizing one of our most accessible resources, health resources that are available now, and that's the community pharmacist. When we think about the community pharmacist, we usually think about the person that's in the white coat, but we don't really understand that the community pharmacy is with public-private partnerships is putting together innovative programs such as the Pharmacy Advisor Program to help educate patients to secure the gap when, for example, if a diabetic patient receives diabetic care but they're not receiving medications that's reflective of the guidelines. With CVS Pharmacy, the pharmacist calls the doctor to make sure that the person is on a statin, such as Lipitor, or is also on a blood pressure medication to protect their kidneys. And we are, we are not accessing the most accessible healthcare professional and looking at the expanded role of the community pharmacist, which is who is already right there. Thank you. Um, one final question, and we've spent a lot of time talking about wards uh, seven and eight. We've got fantastic questions uh, up here on the podium that unfortunately we do not have time to address. So I'll ask this one. The mayor has alluded to it uh, a little bit, but let me ask it more specifically. And it is, how can we have meetings like these in wards seven and eight? I, I think you schedule them. And let there you me go. Tell you, there is not an absence of opportunity. To do that. Let's schedule them. If you, if you think about the Anacostia Library, if you think about the renamed, you know, Benning Road, Benning Library, which is the Dorothy Irene Height Library. If you think about the Deanwood uh, Community Center, which there's no facility like that in the region, let alone the District of Columbia. It has a library, rec center, aquatic center, senior center, and early childhood education program uh, under one roof. We will be finishing the H.D. Woodson High School, which will be a STEM school. It'll be opening uh, in August. Uh, it will be absolutely fantastic and is being designed to be a community uh, resource. You've got, uh, you know, Matthews Memorial Church uh, on Martin Luther King Avenue. You've got the United Medical Center, which has wonderful meeting facilities. So there is not an absence of, there's not an absence of facilities in which to host meetings, but there has to be the will and the commitment to do it. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to our sponsors and our fantastic uh, panelists. Let's give them another round of applause.